Hello friends, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I have with me Ravi Kiran. He is the founder and CEO of Go Life, and uh, we are going to have a lot of interesting discussion around game publishing and how to navigate the entire space. So Ravi, welcome to my channel, and let's start off with a small introduction about yourself. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ravi. I've been in gaming since about 2003. Uh, since the time I was a gamer, I used to play Electronic Sports World Cup, WCG India kind of tournaments mainly for Age of Empires and Warcraft 3 so more of an RTS guy in that sense uh, post that my first gaming company gaming startup was since 2007 one of the first esports companies we did about 250 events cafe, city level, national level 2007 to 2010 we did about 250 events mainly in esports uh, plus we used to do a lot of flash gaming and such we realized that it was too early uh, we used to do live streaming, in fact that's why my group is called Go Live. So just as an example, we used to stream Dota matches with help from Garena, uh, GG client in those days. And we used to have 4,000-5,000 people from India watching it. Wow. Just for comparison, 2011, two and a half years after what we did, Twitch had only 1,000 users live and it was one billion dollar company. We wow. were like, okay, so we never knew the real potential of what we had done. So post that I went to a company called Sierra Atlantic which was which later became Itachi Consulting. They had a 15-20 people gaming team. They grew it to almost 250 people. So when I was really young I saw success in the services side through Itachi Consulting thanks to them. Then I went to Hike. Uh, so I was one of the main first guys, the first producer gaming head of the studio that we set up in Gurgaon. Uh, and SoftBank funded us, so, so very proud of the product side of it. Ki, okay, so services side mein 250 people ka scale tak dekha, product side mein 0 to 10 million dollar funding jo 2012 mein unheard tha. So wo bhi dekha, so we thought wow, so this is it. So I came back from Hike uh, and I restarted the Go Live group. I wanted to retain that name because it had a lot of goodwill in the market. We used to get 300, 400 people from across India applying to go live even though go live was very small uh, before i restarted it in 2016 so we restarted go live this time we restarted it as one company called solutions which is doing key sports and activity another company which is just a studio building and launching games i'll talk about the publishing side a lot more sure. and, and right now i associate with about eight gaming and esports companies in advisory capacity yeah. so in my big picture there is a good publisher he works, the publisher works with all these other ecosystem players and we are a big group. So, so essentially about 8 to 9 companies, I want to make it like a 20 company group who are all coexisting, who are all helping each other out and yeah, that's my vision. Fantastic Ravi. And you know, you are one of the people who has seen the entire industry change right from the flash, web gaming to now mobile gaming, AR, VR, what not. So what have been your observations over this entire changing landscape over the years? How, have, how are things different? How are things easier today or difficult today? What is your opinion on that? Uh, so, so most people when they talk of game development, they just talk of development. The real game is not development, the real game is publishing. Okay. And within publishing there are two aspects which is marketing, user acquisition and distribution. Now there's a new thing, live ops, I'll talk about it later, but these are the two fundamental things, right? So let's start from the web gaming perspective. Web had become really cluttered, so many web browser users and stuff as early as 2005. So if you wanted to build a flash game and get users on your own, getting users is very hard. You had to buy search ads and this and that to get users. Instead, there were some really interesting models at that time addictinggames.com, armor games, max games so you would submit your game to them they had let's say millions of users so if your game was selected you will be showcased your game will be showcased to millions of people maybe 10,000, 100,000, 1 million people will convert and you made money Correct. Okay. so that was the distribution was through these channels and you wouldn't self-publish unless you are a very big guy at that time also there was the Java phones era, yeah. right? But there the distributors were the telcos. So Airtel would have its own VAS portal, Idea might have its own VAS portal, Vodafone and so on, right? So you had to have great relationships with them. 
they will give 70% revenue, give you only 30% revenue, or in some cases as low as 8% yeah. and so on, right? So that was the distribution channels for the mobile games pre-smartphone era. Right. Then by 2010, 2011, things started changing. Yeah. Uh, good thing about my journey is I've always sur been surrounded by amazing people. Just as an example, uh, as early as 2010, we saw that iPhone and iPad, these devices will click with gaming because as those users, we saw that exciting yeah. uh, opportunity. And we also saw the opportunity of working with the Unity or Unreal on top of these platforms. So we had a very interesting uh, project called Project Marker uh, where we're <laughs> I mean, if you remember the story where cats and mice are always fighting with each other, and yeah. some smart mice says, "Let's like put a bell on the cat." Yeah. Right. So, so we made a fun game on that, but on Unreal, uh, in using Unreal Engine on iPad, and when we showed it at GTC, we had a lot of traction, saying, "Wow, okay, so this is the future." So the reason I'm bringing that up is the signs were always there that mobile is going to be big. That was the biggest thing that happened right in front of my eyes. That around 2010 to 2015, 16 was the explosion of mobile gaming. And we were right there at that right point, wherein an Apple store now became the dominant distribution channel. A Play Store became the dominant distribution channel. And we no longer needed to rely on something like VAS, which is the value added services, right? And telcos. So when, when you have a good game, Google is calling you <laughs> and giving you few users. That never happened earlier. Right. Okay. Same thing with Apple as well. Your game is featured, you get millions of users. In fact, if I'm not wrong, the whole mobile boom happened when Steve Jobs talked off Angry Birds at an Apple launch event. Okay. That is, yeah, that, that is the kind of power these distribution channels had. So post distribution, the real thing is publishing, right? So that is where, okay, which all markets do you go to? Yeah. Where all do you do user acquisition? Which markets are performing best? So you scale them. Uh, which distribution channels you have strong tabs with? There are now probably 20 or 30 stores okay. other than Apple and Play Store. Can you make the most of those other stores? So there are so many decisions that publishers take. The challenge that I saw during this whole evolution period is that it became very distribution heavy. So everyone started focusing on stores, but over the last, since 21, 22, I think stores, for whatever their financial reasons at a company level, like the Apple's and Google's yeah. are not trillion dollar companies. Yeah. They can't just give free lunch to everyone. Right. So, so they're curbing user acquisition or free user acquisition a bit. So that is where a lot of the studios if they don't understand publishing are missing out in a big way. So just take a typical example, right? I mean, India has at least some 1400, 1500 dedicated game studios who's only doing game studios. Right. And we have more than 15,000 developers in India who build games. Yeah. As in, there are so many software companies, app companies, which are also building it. 15,000 people are building games, but only five or 10 of them have built profitable games. Right. It's a very small ratio. Just a few years back, there were hundreds of companies which were profitable. So just from a business perspective, I'm explaining, let's say there is Game Yarn, there is Go Live. Let's say we have $100,000 to spend, both of us. Yeah. Okay, so I can acquire in India maybe a million users for that $100,000. You can acquire a million users for that $100,000. Right. Let's say both of us are funded to the tune of $100,000 right. each. My game has only one is to one organic push. So one million became two, two million right. dollars. And I made some twenty thousand dollars with that money, right? Uh, with that user base. So I spent hundred thousand dollars. I made twenty thousand dollars back. Is not a big use case, right? So right. business-wise, people will start questioning. Investors might not appreciate it either. Right. But just imagine that your game gets featured or gets a much better organic pull yeah. due to support from all the ecosystem. Let's say influencers pick it up themselves. Correct. Right. And that game for that million users acquired hits. 10 million users. 1 is to 10. 1 is to 9 or 1 is nine. to 10. Yeah. So suddenly, and, and your game will obviously, because of the big attraction, it won't make 20,000, it'll probably make 90,000 or 80,000. Right. That is a typical story of what happens with developers, right? right. I'm not talking of profitable scenarios yet because profits usually don't come at 
10,000-20,000 level, right. if something is profitable, it <laughs> earns in millions. Correct. That is the dream. That, that's why I encourage gaming entrepreneurs to start young because gaming is still one of those very few industries, not even movie industry, not even music industry, nowhere is someone going to put in X money and probably get a 100X yeah. without doing anything wrong. Right. You're just going to pour your heart and passion into a game. People love it. It could probably become an Angry Birds kind of billion dollar store. Absolutely. Without massive findings or whatever. So, so that's the true thing, right? Where people are missing out is they don't understand publishing. They're building a game. Yeah. Yes, awesome, great job. They probably even get like appreciated. Yeah. But they don't know what to do next. Exactly. So they're, <clears throat> they're just waiting for some magic to happen. Some big publisher to come and yeah. it's not happening anymore. Yeah. There's also something that I uh, cover a lot in my content is that launching a game is not the end of the story. Uh, post launch, what efforts you are taking, right? So, so that's the world of live operations. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Sure. Okay. So, in my personal capacity, so one of our games called Jungle Book Card Battle. Uh, this was about one and a half year before the Jungle Book Disney movie became hmm. a success. So. So we were tied up with a big animation studio with about 3,000 people in, in Hyderabad. So they had an amazing TV series called The Jungle Book. So Jungle Book being a public property, anyone can do a Jungle Book stuff. It's more than nine, nine years now, yeah. the, the author. So the show was good. They aired in 147 countries. So we took the rights for the art of the show and we made a nice looking game. Uh, and, and it was a card game. So you collected yeah. characters. Okay. And we spent less than ten thousand dollars of marketing, and we hit about three point six million user base over the next six months. Wow! So it was featured in some twelve, thirteen countries to automatically and whatnot. So it was a good financial success for us as well. But the most important learning was we had around hundred thousand people on Facebook page on our game page, and even though we were pushing to them saying hey new update is yeah there are five people six people respond so the era of social media yeah. dominating growth is gone now right so so just imagine that you are able to build a 100k on a group without spending a single rupee yeah but you are not able to reach out to those 100,000 engagement is unless you are going to pay yeah. facebook and tell them Hey, I want to reach my 100,000 people, please push it to my 100,000 people. Right. So if we do a campaign, it would push it. So that's a very weird state of things today. It was not like that 4-5 years ago and I'm sure it won't stay like this because yeah. today you have built a group, you can't reach them. Yeah. You have to pay <laughs> these big companies just to reach your own following. Right. It's the same with most of the other groups also. But the second example about live ops is Instead, if we had an active community inside the game, how would it work, right? So there was this amazing game called Gardens of Time. Uh, it's a Facebook game. Uh, I mean, it's a game by, uh, forgot the exact name, uh, but it was ultimately a Disney property. So Disney guys were running it for six years. Yeah. It was game of the year, uh, web game of the year in 2011. Okay. Even 2016, they had 50,000 loyal audience playing the game. So when I was a consultant to a company called Rock U, so when I was working on that game, we built a team in India and we actually put in fresh ideas into the game and stuff for six and a half, seven years after the launch of the game. Okay. And the game started making half a million instead of $300,000 per month. Wow. If you have a loyal community and you have in-game features that the loyal community are used to and they're happy with, they'll come in. That is live operations. Right. So every Wednesday, 50,000 people are waiting for the next update, right. next hidden object game pack, next cool things to buy. And they'll just put 10, 5 dollars, whatever. Yeah. But that's enough. Correct. That's the like half a million dollars a month yeah. coming even 5 or 10 years. That is the power of live operations and that is very important today because if you go back to earlier publishing strategy, if today's market, especially except India, the world has already accepted it, now even in India it's yeah. happening. It's all about, if I bought a user for 10 rupees, can I make 15 rupees from him within a month? If I can, then I'm like scaling the campaign. Right. If I can make it in 3 months, 
okay it's good i'm still going to scale but not very aggressively not aggressively if it is even within a year okay you have burned some money but yeah. you're going to make it back in a year right if it's not going to come back even in a year yeah. you don't have a business story so you won't market the name correct right so so it's all about okay have i put x am i getting x back asap yeah. so that i can continuously do that cycle now what's most important is okay you did it for month 1 month 2 if you did not add new content would be completely different game right because those features are stale the content is stale the roi will not be as good as month 1 yeah. so you have to have new content in the game so the month 2 user feels like hey that guy like my friend who played in month 1 had access to four characters i have access to six heroes right so okay starting rate is not a problem correct that feeling has to be excited in the player for sure. him to play again and again month on month that is literally the game today yeah. without live operations continuous marketing no game is going to be a success absolutely and i agree to this fact because you know we have games like uh, your dotas and your counter strikes uh, which are almost decade old games and still they continue to be profitable in some cases uh, i don't know the numbers specifically but i'm pretty sure they are still relevant primarily because of live ops right absolutely yeah. so in fact you took two very in- interesting examples right look at dota first if you don't have a new hero yeah there is no reason for 90% of the players to come back to the game because from the earlier hero pool yeah. they would not win let's say i can't win with nine of my friends with all yeah. the 40 existing heroes i'm excited about the 41st hero because yeah. if it connects with me if i like that gameplay style the powers yeah now i can go back with the 41st hero and go compete with my friends right and i'm talking of two esport games same thing with counter strike counter strike is not just about skins of course there yeah. is a secondary market worth billions in counter strike right. but the real fun of counter strike is there's a new map yeah so so there is a chance that let's say someone is a camper someone is an aggressive assault someone is a sniper whatever that may be in that new map there is that small additional opportunity for my gameplay style to click click otherwise if i'm always losing why would i play again and again and again Right. So you have to have new content. You have to have new maps, new mods, new characters, so the gameplay is not stale. Right. Especially in esports games, gameplay cannot be stale. Correct. If you look at Valorant today, if there is a new character that's coming out, that is when people are excited. If there's nothing coming out, they yeah. won't play. They'll stop playing and move on. Right. And uh, just to also backtrack and talk a little bit about the entire process of publishing. So say if I were to ask you how would you explain game publishing to a 3 year old kid what would your answer be Very interesting I can't say 3 year old kid but let's yeah. say a teenager teenager okay. yeah. so so publishing is just three parts first part is user acquisition so I have a cool product how do I get users to try my product out second yeah. part is engagement and retention so okay let's say because these are premium games if if it's a premium game your job ended with the first part itself right people came they tried it out your job is done you just need to ensure they don't have a bad experience and leave your game by scolding you yeah but most game world today is premium so the second part is okay i've got let's say million people to try my game out i have to ensure that the next update i don't need to put money again to buy the same 1 million players right, right? so i have to have enough content and unique content in the game that i can like retain these players over yeah. a period the third part is continuity so this is where most people miss out the reason why sequels work is because if people liked let's say witcher 1 yeah they have a good memory yeah. they're going to come for witcher 2 right most yeah. developers most publishers don't have that vision to even think of sequels or think of continuity what i mean by continuity is if if you look at my studio my yeah. studio means strategy collectible card games so we're all big fans of legends of doom terras hearthstone yeah. and the like so all the way from 15 years ago right so when you look at our games our game one might be a cat warrior game where you're collecting cat warriors for a different audience our game two might be a cute cat game where you're collecting pet cats yeah but the framework and the thought process is the same right so once in made a certain audience let's say i have a million people who like my warrior fighting games i'm going to make a mahabharata hmm. where 
it's not cats, but it's still fantasy warrior fighting games. Right. So the audience who like the fantasy warrior fighting collection loop yeah. will come back to my second game. Basically for the difference of theme is. It's, it's not, so you have to have some difference because that is where the freshness right. is. Because if I make a second cat warrior game, yeah. maybe people might not come back at all. Right. But if the theme was different, they know that the loop is fun. If the loop is I'll collect cards, I'll form a team, I'll defeat others by outplaying them with my strategy. That yeah. is the loop, core loop. So you have to give them something similar so that that audience becomes a fan of your type of games. That is how you're building a brand for me. And I'm not saying I'm doing it with one. I'm also doing it with pet cats, maybe pet animals or pet dogs or whatever as well. Right. Because that's a different audience. Okay. So, so my audience, at least from my research or my team's research, what you understood is 35 plus women is an audience that pays and engages and retains. Oh. So we have one set of games just being built for them. Wow. There is a sports audience, especially in India, mainly young adults, 18 to 24, who like sports a lot. So they're looking out for sport games. So we are making a series of sports games. But the common thing about warrior fighting games, like cute games and sports games is the underlying framework and the methodology because people, when they become a fan of a brand, they, like a gaming company is a brand here, right? Yeah. They will look positively towards us. We give a good experience to the first game they play, but not just that, when you have something similar. So, so you're not surprising them completely. Correct. It's not like the first game was a cute cat game. Second game is like a ferocious, violent right. shooter. Right. Because the audience is completely different. There. Right. You talked about a metric that personally is a little surprising for me. You talked about, you know, uh, for your games, you're finding that female audience. Not all games, one series of games. One series of games, uh, female audience above 35 are playing your game. So can you share a little bit of insights on that? So, so what we have observed is for the roadmap for live operations, you need to understand who your audience is was connected with that game. So when I take an example of Jungle Book game, right? Yep. When we started Jungle Book game, by the time it came to peak, there was also this hype about Jungle Book movie. Right. So, Jungle Book movie was good for kids, but it's a little violent themed and stuff, right? So, we expect a lot of teenagers to play our game. What we realized was most of the paying users and also the hardcore audience for us were kids. Yeah. We, we knew that from the reviews, from right. the parents saying, hey, my kid likes this very much. Like, we never made a game for kids. Yeah. But like I mean, kids as an 8 to 13 type of kids of course we had no yeah. violence and stuff so our game is 3 plus so right. anyone can play but our target audience when we started publishing was not kids it was teenagers, teenagers. we did some events in colleges and stuff yeah. we never did anything for kids for in fact we well. don't even we can't even advertise properly in schools yeah. or kids right Correct. so but the game became viral in kids and uh, even when I went to a friend's house he had a 6 year old daughter she was playing my game. They had no idea it was my game. Wow. And I was like so happy, right? That someone completely unknown without my any push liked the game. And I was just asking her what do you I like Mowgli, I like Share Khan. And I was like, okay, so basically so you need to understand who your target is and then figure out your next set of campaigns for them because then we realized why there were some very high retention numbers, especially in the kids audience, because for them, it's not the next combat, next tournament. Our game was supposed to be a tournament game. Yeah. So we had an arena mode where every week we used to give top five presents. The top five were always teenagers or young adults. But the players playing the game were mainly yeah. kids. Yeah. So then we tuned our game to ensure there are more fresh content. So for example, there is this little red panda yeah. character. So we got that panda character and our engagement spiked up. Yeah. So that's so cute, funny little panda character, right? The yeah. kids like. So, so you have to understand who are your audience uh, and like I said for Cat Town, right? So there's so many women in New York kind of success of the games. Concept came from a couple of articles about that. Ki they don't have time to take care of their pet cats anymore. Mm -hmm. So so they have these pet cafes, pet coffee shops. Yeah. So you leave them there like you leave your babies in a crash. Yeah. These 
these owners like pet owners especially cat owners they leave that in that cat cafe of cat sorts cafe. yeah go to office while going home take the cat back and go home okay or they even have pet sitters so they have like babysitters they yeah. are like engage pet sitters to come take care of like okay this is a completely new concept yeah. especially for us in india and i thought okay this has to be a very fun loop so we created a game where all you have when you start the game is a cat once you're like taking care of it properly you have some love this in game currency yeah. the more love you have the more cats you can unlock okay. now when you unlock you need to upgrade your home to house more cats and together this loop comes out very well yeah. and only if you can't take care of the those cats they become unhappy yeah. so you go unlock a pet sitter hire the pet sitter inside nice. the game and yeah i mean this is a game that was selected for app scale academy by google so we think the loop is really good so it's just launched but what we understood in the focus group test is women ago that if i like it lovely and uh, now let's talk a little bit about platforms uh, so you majorly talked about mobile as platform right uh, nowadays <coughs> due to the entire 2020 post 2020 era uh, advertising revenue has gone down and uh, you know we are also seeing a small shift in terms of people accepting more hardcore experiences so can you shed a little light on you know what is going to be the future of mobile pc or console games any insight on that side okay so let me break down that in different perspectives first perspective that you mentioned is advertising is going down mm-hmm. why is it going down advertising highest cpms come when there are conversions right so today let's say if game 1 has an ad of game 2 clicking on game 2 is step 1 for conversion Right. but installing game 2 from within game 1 is the highest conversion right people are not flooded with content that they don't go and install anymore right so if even today those installs will happen you will still have high ecpms right ecpms go down a lot especially over the last 3 4 years because people are not installing second game right in fact they are just seeing those ads yeah. for that reward if there is a reward right other is even that and offer worlds used to be another form of ad monetization offer worlds have also gone down because incentivizing someone to get some benefit in game 1 to me was always a wrong loop mm. that you do install game 2 and do something then i'll get something in game all is doing in game 2 is because of game 1 yeah. the day it gets is reward is uninstall game 2 correct so it didn't serve anyone's purpose so that is one part second part is if you look at the overall ecosystem just take me an example of india there are almost 8 10 million mobile users 600 million of them have played at least one mobile game in some form over the last year or so so 600 million mobile gamers only 30 to 40 are hardcore gamers uh, 30 to 40 million so those 30 to 40 million are maybe half of them or most of them are the paying users all others might be in rng games because the group forces them to play right. uh, but let's keep that completely independent the real thing is that the there are 30 to 40 million gamers who are paying for good games and stuff to it so that conversion according to platforms like google is where the opportunity lies because every 3 years the propensity to buy is doubling so if let's say today 1% indians are going to pay in 3 years 2% of indian gamers will pay yeah and likewise the price points that they're paying let's say the preferred price point is 5 rupees in 3 years the preferred price point will become 10 rupees okay. so basically what's happening is across 3 to 4 years the industry size is quadrupling 2x growth because number of payers are increasing 2x growth because the average price point is increasing right so that's 4x growth in 3 years in 6 years that's 16x growth 16x yeah so people building for that 16x growth have yeah. a great opportunity now this is independent of mobile or pc or console because even pc and console today is kind of free made and i'm i would say i'm only a good and expert at indian ecosystem i'm focusing mainly on that yeah. globally it's like 3 to 5% growth per year which is not even exciting Yeah. Why, why should I mean unless you are like a billion dollar company trying to earn five percent extra, <laughs> what is five percent growth? But in India, 
the opportunity is that in six years, if it's a 16x growth, yeah. are you ready to capitalize on it? That's why we are an India only publisher. So, so every game that we publish is only for India. Yeah. If it clicks in India, we do some of the other countries. Like for example, a cricket game, it's doing decently well in India. So we're looking at Australia, New Zealand, UK, South Africa. Yeah. Because there's cricket audience there. But that's one part. The second part is the ecosystem, when you look at it, uh, I, I heard from a report recently that in one of the latest sales, the big billion dollar sale kind of a thing that happens, right? Billion day sale, I think. Yeah. Okay. There are 400,000 iPhones for sale. Wow. 4 lakh. Okay. It's not a big number in comparison to the 5 crore mobile phones sold in India. Yeah. But if 4 lakh of them, the most premium users, are buying iPhones, and over a year they buy 20 lakh iPhones out of the 4 crore pool but these 20 lakhs are the paying users right so in 6 years while the industry grows iPhone might become very dominant for people to definitely build for right likewise when you look at PC during Covid about 32 million new PCs were sold in India we, we work with esports right so a lot of these gaming hardware companies they saw an unthinkable boom so whether it's gaming or gaming hardware, gaming laptops, gaming desktops, so all of them are plush with marketing budgets. Right. So they have put all of that marketing budgets and now they have done so much marketing that the growth did not just die off, but it's continuing. Yeah. Because once someone plays on a gaming laptop or a gaming system, he's not, I mean, just for another 30, 40,000 rupees, Instead of a 40,000 laptop, is going to buy an 80,000 laptop because he knows that, okay, during COVID I had time to play a game, but even now I'll find time to play a game at least for a couple of hours a month okay. and a couple of hours a week or whatever. And for that, I can't do it on a 30,000 laptop. So, right. so that market has gotten created. Right. So PC gaming will be big. Again, see that 16x growth yeah. is not happening only on one platform. Yeah. It's going to percolate into PC for sure. Console, I, I really respect the Sony guys. They've done this cool new program called yeah, India Hero Project. Project. So, so we're expecting that. So so just to give an example, I did my first console project in 2010 on Nintendo. We had to wait for seven months just for the dev kits to come to India started. from Japan. Yeah. So I gave a talk about this at GDC 2011 or so. But the point is, IGDC, sorry, IGDC 2011. Point is, Development has become much more easier today because of Unity, Unreal and all these. Right. And if the platforms, especially the console platforms come to the front, then this growth will not just stick to PC or mobile, it will yes. also go to consoles. But yes. the, the opportunity is on the console side. Right. Indians keep us present, that everyone knows. Right. And India will become a 10 trillion economy. That means uh, there, there is this theory that about $3,500 per capita income average of rich hote hain. So people have like 10% of their money for luxury and fun, right. entertainment and so on. Right. So, so we have around 2400 cash person, the day we hit 3500, yeah. which is probably two years from now, people are book my show with 300 rupee ticket, currently okay, uh -huh. movies and stuff are nothing compared to the rush games. that games can give, right? So, yeah. sab log gamers hai, gamers hi yeah. and movies in sab ke saath compare kore to gaming like I said 16, 20x growth hoga. Yeah. So across all platforms but on the consoles, consoles have to take the lead. Yeah. If you don't have an Xbox division pushing, uh, I know Xbox has also started some really good programs. So Xbox has to push the Xbox development from Indian content perspective. So PlayStation has to push content from Indian. Because that is the unique thing about India. Right. Netflix, they go, maybe they go, Indian originals. It's not that the US ke top 10 will go here. It will go, but that is for 1% of India. Right. If you want scale, you have to build it for 30% of India, who right. are the like, real target market. Right. 70% of India will take time. Maybe 5-6 years will take for them to become real gamers, real uh, what do you say, paying users. But 30% right. like, of India is ready. Today, make a good game. Banao, 30% of India, some 3 to 5 crore people will play your game. We are hoping we will be one of them. I know you guys are doing very good stuff. Yeah. So that is the opportunity. Yeah. And uh, 
the pointers that you talked about actually indicate that now India is catching up to the global market. Uh, earlier, I mean, all the rock stars and electronic arts, they have been established since the last 30 to 40 odd years, right? India is just seeing that boom. And the doubling that you mentioned, like on the scale that we have in India, it's going to like shoot up drastically. So what's your perspective on India catching up to the global market even after having the disadvantage of the last few decades being lost up? So, so that's the power of compounding here. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, so if you look at, let's say an average spending of a gamer annually in Japan, it might be something like $200, $300 per year. In India, it's probably $2 per year. Okay, so I remember a very big uh, company had a fantastic racing game. I don't want to take the name. They said, Unka Singapore revenue India is more Singapore is like not even like half of the population of Mumbai, if I'm not wrong. So, a city ka, se jo aara hai paise for gamers buying that game, poor India is not coming. Okay, that is why they ignore the market. Yeah. But the forward looking companies, they don't do that. Forward looking companies know that the two will become 4, 4 will become 8, 8 will become 8, 32 will So, over some 10 to 12 years, this will be as big as Singapore and at 1000x scale in population. So, so only, I mean, so one of the core verticals in GoLive is to work with international companies like Riot, Disney, when they launch their games in India. We're actually like their extended arm because we know India market. Pata hai. Yeah. So, so, for example, Team Fight Tactics, Legends of Rune Terra, Chess Games. I helped Riot to launch in India successfully. Launch yeah. Disney, ko Marvel, Super War, and so on. The reason why I took these names up is these companies are forward looking. They know that India has a base in India. They know that Disney is not only animated movies, but also the games are released. Right. Then a Disney game is like, wow, Disney ka game. Right. Right? Or a Riot game is, wow, Riot is not a game. Hai. So, so, jo log forward looking hai, they do amazing stuff. Fantastic. And uh, Ravi, any final uh, pointers for the audience about Go Live? See, I, I think your audience are predominantly young people who are interested in coming into gaming and stuff. Yeah. I tell only one fundamental thing, right? Uh, ki gaming ecosystem is gonna boom, no doubt about that. But with two filters. Filter number one, you have to be good at it. Today is the world of AI. Yeah. If you are average at anything, you will not do anything in that job. There will not be a job where you will not get a promotion. So please be good at whatever thing you want to pick. Game art, game development, worst is game testing. You are an amazing gamer, there are so many jobs as game testers. But be really good. Because you will not play new games, you will not play new games, you will not play new games. You might play Dota with interest for a thousand times. Are you willing to play, let's say, uh, Candy Crush for a thousand times. Yeah. To the open mind, sir. The second thing is because you have to upskill yourself, upskill yourself in the right way. Don't just do a six, six month degree or one one year degree and say I'm a gaming expert. Spend that time. Right. Okay. So I'll give you an example comparing IT. IT may a time mein, like early two thousands like late two thousand se pehle dot com boom ke time pe. कोई भी एक चेमंत वाला जावा कोर्स करके सक्सेसफुल था यूके में यूएस में कहीं भी जाके जॉब आज नहीं होगा ना आज कंप्यूटर इंजीनियरिंग करना है नहीं तो एटलिस्ट तीन चार साल जावा ये सब पढ़ना है वैसे ही सोचो दैट्स व्हेन यू हैव अ ग्रेट करियर इन गेम फैंटास्टिक रवि दिस वाज अ ग्रेट इंटरेक्शन थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर टेकिंग योर टाइम एंड गाइस चेक आउट देयर प्लेटफार्म चेक आउट देयर वेबसाइट फॉलो देम ऑन सोशल मीडिया रवि विल मेंशन योर लिंक्डइन प्रोफाइल एज़ वेल फॉर पीपल एंड एंड वी हैव दिस वेरी कूल गेम कॉल्ड क्रिकेट स्टार्स व्हिच इज लाइव एंड कैट ऑन जस्ट वेंट लाइव डू चेक दोस आउट यस ऑल द लिंक्स विल बी इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन गाइस इफ यू लाइक दिस वीडियो हिट द लाइक बटन इफ यू आर फाइंडिंग माय चैनल फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम हिट द सब्सक्राइब बटन एंड द बेल आइकन सो यू डोंट मिस आउट ऑन माय अदर वीडियोस I, uh, I keep on making uh, videos on games and game development and I have a lot more interactions like these on my channel lined up. So that's it for this video. Uh, I'll see you in my next one. Until then, take care.